All right, everyone. Uh, I tried to go with like a super sexy title for this, and yeah, that's the best I can pop it. <laughs> At least it rhymes, you know. <laughs> that's the best I can do. So yeah, contributions. Um, there are loads of different types of contributions. Obviously, there's code. Uh, funding in the case of kind of the MariaDB Foundation, documentation is a contribution uh, that's really useful at the moment. Uh, we're talking a lot this week how we could improve docs and stuff like that. Um, community, and by community, I mean things like uh, helping users out. If you know how to do SQL and stuff like that, and helping users out on Reddit um, and Stack Overflow and all those kind of places, there are contributions that are really kind of useful to us. Translations. Uh, I kind of grew up in England, so I speak one language only because our education system sucks. Uh, so, yeah, translating to your local language uh, is really helpful for us. There's a new translation portal we've now released for the uh, MariaDB Foundation, which can help with that kind of thing. And then just using things, using MariaDB and telling us what's good, telling us what's not good, feature requests, bug reports, all those kind of things. They count as contributions as well. And you know, I want to make sure that everyone knows these kind of things are just as valued as being able to code for MariaDB itself. Uh, so, as I said, there are loads of different uh, non-code contributions. Uh, one sponsor I always pick out when I do this kind of slide is uh, Intel. Uh, so, Intel is a sponsor of MariaDB Foundation, and uh, it's quite complicated for their internal processes to give code contributions. So instead when they've got new platforms they're working on and things like that they will tell us uh we've tried MariaDB on this and you could do these few things to actually make it run a bit faster and they'll work with marco and etc to make those kind of improvements they run regular benchmarks on MariaDB and try and find areas of the code which are bottlenecks and due to those kind of things we've seen some great performance uh, improvements to MariaDB over the uh, past several releases but uh, today I'm mostly going to be talking about code contributions. Uh, so why are they important to us? You can get a, a much more diverse input, uh, a range of life experiences. So if you if you spread the code contributions from, say, the US, from England, uh, Finland, Sweden, all these different countries, there's all different life experiences, all different corporate experiences, there's all different use cases. Um, it kind of molds the project into something which could be used by everybody instead of just a small subset of people. Um, and it means the direction of the project is one that's not led by just a corporation PLC. It's led by the users, which I think is a really good thing. And you get to fix the things that are important to you. You could, you could have something that's important to you. You file a feature request or a bug report, and because it's not important to a corporation in control of a project. It's something that might sit there for years and nothing happens, but you're welcome to, if you're able to do it, you're welcome to contribute that feature or bug or whatever. And uh, immediately you can get into the project a lot quicker. And there's the whole kind of community aspect of it. It's kind of why I'm, I do this kind of thing. It's building communities around open source software. So with these kind of things, uh, we gather metrics to figure out the shape of the community, the contributions, etc. Uh, everything I'm going to say here is open source. And in fact, uh, you can download the reports, the raw data for the reports uh, from our GitHub uh, releases, and they are published on blog posts, etc. We used a tool called GitDM. It's a, I've modified it quite a bit because GitDM stands for Git Data Miner. It was designed with the Linux kernel in mind and generates um, contribution metrics for them. Um, it didn't quite fit our use case perfectly, so I've uh, improved it in a few places, particularly with the way it generates the CSV files on the output. And it's, it literally it, it, uh, it takes some basic configuration, which is uh, a contributor's email address and then what entity they work for or just independent if they're independent. Um, and it also will track uh, the dates that they worked at certain entities. So uh, a good example is Otto. Um, he worked for the MariaDB Foundation for a while, and now he works for Amazon. So I've got the dates that he worked for those different entities. So it correctly attributes his commits to the right thing. The other thing it does is aliases, um, which is really smart because 
for example, when I was at the MariaDB Corporation, I had the email address ahutchings at mariadb.com, andrew.hutchings at mariadb.com, andrew at linuxjedi.co.uk, and a bunch of other email addresses. And also GitHub, if you try and edit a commit in GitHub, it then gives this really long, unique email address as well uh, to your commit. So um, the aliasing file can actually make sure that all of these different email addresses are just one person in real life. So you don't kind of say it's 10 different people for one trip. Uh, in fact, I had to fix it because Roman has several different email addresses that uh, broke the stats recently. So uh, I try to keep this up to date, but you're welcome to go to github.com slash server slash metrics and look at the configuration files and fix them if you can find I've got your name wrong or, or details wrong in there because at the moment it's mostly me uh, updating the files uh, every three months and uh, I'm about to make mistakes at some point. There's good thousand odd entries in there, I think. So it's, it's, uh, it's a lot there. Yes. And uh, where's the information taken from? Like, how do you know? Where's the information taken from? Uh, affiliation. See, like, is it someone Oh, affiliation. Affiliate. Affiliate. So it's, Somewhat, it's not quite guesswork, it's somewhat guesswork. So what I do is I see a new email address for a contributor. I will research to find out what their GitHub user is. If they've got an affiliation on GitHub, uh, that's the one I'll use. Um, if not, then I might do some research, almost stalking, and <laughs> look into their LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, and basically try and find if there is an affiliation for them. And usually, like, the from the commit you can usually tell whether it's something they did for work or whether it's something they did personally as well which helps also if it's google summer co student for example i know the google i've been in the google summer Code project you know i've got the list of people who were google summer code contributors so i try and manually collate all this to figure it out there are going to be quite a few mistakes where i've said someone's independent when they're not because i honestly can't figure it out um, and this is actually where i most need help uh, with these configuration files is just not knowing who certain people are. Um, but I'm pretty sure I've got like all the corporation, the foundation, the bit larger contributors down uh, without any trouble. Uh, there are also some other scripts I run every three months, which are pull request scripts. So what they do is they talk to the GitHub API and we'll look at uh, every single pull request uh, that's happened in a given period and they will categorize it and, coll and collate information based on it. So it'll count the number of open pull requests. It, 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 it does it, per I do it in a, a week grouping. So in a given week, the number of open, number of close. Sorry, so can you try? <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, so it does the open pull requests, close pull requests, merge pull requests. Uh, it also does metrics of pull requests handling such as whether a pull request was merged, but wasn't, um, there was no comments on the pull request before it was merged, which is a bad thing. I'll get to that later on, but there, there's metrics for that. There are metrics on um, draft pull requests. There's a, there's a whole list of things it collates. Um, well, and I'll do, oh, sorry. Um, well, I'll do it uh, when pull request is called, like, not DBT for a while. Yes, actually, that's the next bullet point. The reports on pull requests that require attention. Uh, so actually, there's two things. So in the metrics, there are the number. There's the number of days, uh, the average number of days between a pull request being open and a first meaningful comment on a pull request by someone who is not the author uh, and someone who is in the. Um, committing committers, whatever the committers group is in GitHub. Well, uh, metrics are fine, I see lots of uh, metrics that are normally extra points, so I'm asking if you actually do something about... Uh, this... if, you detect, if you detect and actually do something about pull requests without an and also those kind of things. So Lou, those particular metrics are very new, so at the moment I'm gathering and not acting on them. Apart from the report section, which I'm starting to act on the report, uh, will generate pull requests that the lot uh, a list of pull requests that are the longest since anyone has ever, ever touched. Yes. Um, so those ones I'm starting to act on. Um, so that's it's a new script. It uses the same base code, but it's a script will say uh, pull requests like one seven two three has not been acted on for a thousand days. You know, someone should do something about it. <laughs> so 
there's that kind of report I generate now, um, which I think is really useful. Another thought I've got when you're talking more, what well, maybe a good idea to detect stuff that Octa is complaining about, not proper attribute for Skype. I don't know how, how but <laughs> ChatGPT <laughs> <laughs> can uh, take a semantics out of the text and maybe comments. So this way it can be used for categorizing. Well, I've made it quite easy to process once you've got this uh, to, to when you've got the data from the API to process it. So it's just adding more processing features to it. So there's something we could definitely extend, but the reporting I only added in the last two months. So that's all new. And the extended part of the metrics gathering for pull requests is all new as well. So there's a lot they could do and feel free to open uh, Jira tickets on it in um, the MDBF uh, Jira, then uh, I can work on them if there's anything extra you think that's needed. But you can see the CSV output files um, that I, the latest one I'm going to be releasing in the next few days as soon as I actually get time to finish the blog post and that will be published. Everything's open source and I say snapshots every three months. Uh, so the state of contributions that it stands today, um, this is based on, I actually ran the scripts yesterday, um, so <laughs> uh, you've got fairly accurate. So we've got 2023 so far, so first, pretty much first three, uh, three quarters of 2023, there have been 30 contributors from ReadyB Corporation, seven for the foundation and 51 from elsewhere. Um, that's fewer than the whole of 2022 for every category, but at the same time, we've still got another quarter left to go. So I'm expecting them to kind of be similar by the end of the year. Um, yes. Uh, maybe that's how, no, how no, you would approach it. How exactly you would, like what is the number? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so PLC is down to 30 from 36. I think there are several factors behind that, particularly around um, all the changes have happened in the PLC in the last year or so. Um, I haven't dug into that to fight, figure out who's missing and things. The foundation one is an odd one. So there is eight there instead of seven. And the reason for that is a commit from 2020 created by Otto was merged in 2022. So when he wrote that commit, he worked for the foundation. So it counts as a foundation in 2022. It due to the way get DM processes things. <laughs> even though he now he doesn't work for the foundation. So it's a bit of a funny one and I get why, why it's like that. But uh, And then you get to see the number of commits and we're pretty much, I think, on par for by the end of the year being almost the same number of commits for um, PLC. Foundation might be slightly ahead from last year. Uh, it's difficult to get a metric that's based on the amount of work done because I could do lines of code change, but then you could run one script to change 10,000 lines of code and that's almost no effort. Uh, or you could spend um, the entire week debugging something that's one line of code change, you know, so it's very difficult to gauge effort done. And so no metric here is going to be perfect on the amount of work done. So I've got also lines added and lines deleted. And that's hard as well because a commit that changes a line can be a line deleted and line added or you could delete a million lines of code and add no lines. So there's, there's no great way of getting this data at the moment, but it was the best I could do. I'm curious if uh, we can derive the semantics of saying either autopilot, LLM, or ChatGPT. Yes. Semantics. And using this semantic, it is less complicated for us to make a commit. And with that, you can come up with a way. That could definitely be done. Um, it doesn't actually take long to generate this report at all. So um, we could add extra code in to do your extra processing. It's just time doing it at the moment. Uh, so my dream state would be there will be more contributions. For, we've got more contributors already outside, really PLC and Foundation than inside. But it'd be fantastic if we could have more. Yes. So, okay. um, there's some, uh... Um, how, how would we get the complexity? Okay. Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, 
that that's the hard part. Yeah, I'd I'd love it if we could. I just don't know how to do it. Uh, and uh, Roman suggested uh, an AI based system to to look at the commits and see complexity based on that. Hmm? Yeah, the, the, we could certainly look into that. At the moment, we do gather lines of code changed and stuff. It's just if I put all the data on a slide, you won't be able to read it because it's just so much of it. But... My point was actually not much about measuring, but how to uh, increase it, whatever, even if you cannot measure. Oh yeah. I mean, well, I mean, lots of contributors that are just you know change uh, one space somewhere or touch. Oh, I see. Some more complex contributions coming yeah. from outside. Yes. That is a longer game. <laughs> that is something I'd love to see. But I think it's more if we started be having a a good process of planning features in the open that um, people can get on board with. Um, I, we probably, I know we do have processes, but they're not well documented to the outside and how to do this kind of stuff. So um, they, if people could work with us on planning new features and developing the features themselves, uh, then I think we would, that would open the doors to getting larger contributions. Um, I've spoken to Amazon and they, they, that's the kind of thing they want. They, they want to contribute bigger stuff, but they're not quite sure how to work with us at the moment. I've been trying to talk them through it, but we really need something hard document, documented for that. Um, Did you see how long time that they discussed working with the feature before creating the point press? They do not at the moment. They should. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I mean, there there is sometimes they do in the M Dev beforehand. But I think they could, there they, they could be a better way. And I, I think we, it's something we need to discuss and figure out. But um, yeah, uh, so I'd love to see more contributions. Uh, eventually, some decision making uh, about what goes in and what doesn't made by people outside of Marie B. Yes. Yeah. So, so well, rather. That's a loaded question. So yes, I can. <laughs> I've worked for quite a few open source projects that do things very differently, um, and there are things we can change in ReDB, but it's not a quick fix, if you know what I mean. Uh, over time, I will hopefully be finding ways of implementing good changes, good process changes like that, in ways that will keep Sergey and Monty and everyone happy as well. So uh, we will figure out a balance eventually. But first of all, the first step is to properly document in like a governance file or something, way, the way things are right now. That, and then we can look at how things could change in the future, essentially. Um, that's 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 uh, something we can look into. But for now, <laughs> it's, it's uh, a bit of a different. But you know, remember, like MariaDB has got decades of legacy behind it where the developers are used to being things a certain way as well. So change is very difficult in that respect. Uh, but I, we've got great strides, you know, we're using GitHub now where we're using, uh, we're using Bazaar for a while on um, Launchpad. And then before that, it was BitKeeper, I think, and <laughs> a few other things. So we, more modern tools are coming in. And I think that, that's always a good thing. Did you look into uh, what kind of for everybody? Uh, yes. Yes. One of my slides mentions Postgres somewhere. <laughs> but, but yes, um, it's kind of out of scope for this talk because of the, the time. But yes, I, I have looked into other projects and trying to. There's no one model that fits every project perfectly, but there's. You know, every project can do better. Uh, so, I mean, how con contributions work kind of right now is um, assuming everything's planned and everything. Um, 
a pull request is opened by the contributor and it's usually attached to a Jira ticket. If not, it should be attached to a Jira ticket. Um, there's a bot called CLA Assistant and that checks for uh, a signed CLA by the contributor. So if you don't know what CLA is, it's a contributing license agreement and it essentially signs the copyright for the code over to MariaDB. Uh, alternatively, you can contribute using a three clause BSD license if you're not comfortable with CLAs. I know a lot of people aren't. Um, and that process can be approved a little bit. The CLA system we're using at the moment is not great. It's a bit buggy. And if you want to declare BSD, you have to go as if you're signing a CLA and then choose BSD right at the end before you sign it. So it's a bit of a odd process, but uh, we, we can definitely improve there. The pull requests run in new build bots. Um, some of the reporters will automatically report back to GitHub. Some of them don't at the moment. I would want to improve that situation. It's just I also don't want 200 entries in GitHub saying that this was checked by this build and this was true. So uh, we haven't come up with a happy medium for that yet. So it's just at the moment, the most important ones are blockers. Um, and some of them are not blockers, but report, and then some don't report at all. Uh, we have to actually go in to BuildBot and find the state of them. Uh, but that, that's something we're working on. It's getting better all the time, but there's still some work to do there. Uh, and then a review will review the code, and uh, if it's good, it's in the right place, and everything, it meets everyone's checks, it will get merchants to the code base. Uh, how to improve? Um, these, a lot of these things have come up this week uh, already, but um, I'd love it if we had the same process, regardless of whether you're a corporation developer, PLC developer, or a community developer, a Google Summer Code student, whatever. I'd love the process of code being reviewed out in the open the same, regardless. Um, I'd love um, open discussion on features, and I mentioned Postgres there. <laughs> um, the way they do it is essentially a feature is request is declared on a mailing list, and if uh, once that's discussed, it's approved, then there's a wiki page that's created where um, the progress of that is kind of tracked and everything. Um, and there's a lot of good process behind that. I'm not quite sure when the tooling is right for us, but the process is good, I think. Um, I'd love it if we had two core reviewers to approve code. Again, this is something else I've mentioned this week. And um, this is something we can actually do quite easy, that when the code has been approved, GitHub can just automatically, and the CI is passed as well, GitHub can automatically merge it. Uh, so this is, this is a step we could take, and we've uh, discussed with Daniel, we might do this at some point quite soon. So I'm not quite sure how this, well this graph is going to come out because it's uh, quite tight. But this is just two of the metrics I get for pull requests. So the red line here is the number of uh, still open pull requests per week. Uh, and we hover roughly around the 150 mark, which is not a good place to be in. <laughs> and it's my job to get that down and it's been slowly going up. So yeah, that's... <laughs> Uh, I need to fix that. The blue line is the number of new pull requests per week here. So that hovers somewhere in the region of 10 to 20 a week of new ones coming in. So we, we, we're we kind of keeping a rough balance of new ones coming in and being closed, but not getting rid of too many of the old legacy ones. Um, that's something I've been trying to work on roughly when that dip happened. <laughs> uh, but it's it's a lot of work to do that and it'll be a long way before we can actually get that down to uh, the bottom. Uh, pull requests for 2023 to date. So there have been 24 pull requests merged without any public review whatsoever. And what that means is the author opened the pull request uh, there was no comments by anyone with authority on the pull request, and then it was merged by that author. There are 24 of them have happened in the last year. Uh, that's a bad thing, so we need to fix that. <laughs> that particular metric is internal people. 
<laughs> so it, it, each one of these metrics filters in a slightly different way, but that one filters on people who have commit rights, who have opened a pull request, there have been no public comments, and it's been merged by that same person. So not an ideal situation because we don't know why they did it, and it could be a, a, a process of abuse. It could also be that the, the thing was reviewed outside of GitHub, but at least it needs to be a comment saying, hey, this was reviewed outside of GitHub because otherwise... But I know who it is, and they have been spoken to about it, and <laughs> uh, hopefully that will stop happening. But now we have the metrics to show them that this has been happening, and we can fix these kind of things. Uh, the average day is the first meaningful response, and this is a tricky metric to get. Um, the way we are counting a meaningful response at the moment is... Uh, a pull request is opened, and then someone who isn't the author, who is a who has commit rights, has either commented or submitted a review on the pull request. So the time between those two dates is what we call a meaningful response. That doesn't mean the response was actually meaningful at all. It's just very hard in an automated way, given how much processing time just is just to generate that metric to actually get that right. Yes. Yeah. So the raw CSV data has the real spiky stuff in it, yeah, which yeah, shows. I'm saying that yeah. Spikes. Uh, I can do. Uh, it's it's just a CSV file, so you can just generate the the mediums from the CSV. I just haven't done it. Yeah, no, that's a good point though. So we have some in there that have, you know, get responded on like within within a day, so almost like zero days. And then you get some that don't get responded on for a thousand days. So <laughs> there are some real spikes like that. Um, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. Again, I was trying to fit something on this slide that, you know, uh, if I put the raw data on here, there's no way you'd be able to see it because it's just, and it's just like... I'm curious if you would compare this metric with other points. It's possible to compare it the... I do not at this time, that is a good point, though. We should do that. Uh, so the number of new pull requests so far this year is 376, and the number closed is 346. So there's actually only about 30 difference sort of between the two. And that is everything I had. We are on time. We've got a couple of minutes if anyone's got any questions.